Elon Musk is in trouble with the NLRB, and the former CEO of Starbucks is in trouble with Bernie Sanders. There's new blood at the OAW, and we'll discuss what's wrong at the unions. All that and more as Labor This Week begins now. Hello, I'm Mark Harrison. After being threatened with a subpoena if he didn't show up, former Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz took part in a contentious hearing last week on Capitol Hill as the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee began its investigation into labor law violations by major corporations. The committee is chaired by Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont, and during his opening remarks, he set the tone for the day by reminding Mr. Schultz that federal law prohibits any witnesses from knowingly and willfully making false statements relative to an inquiry. The former CEO quickly fired back that Starbucks had not broken any laws, and with that, they were off. Schultz purchased the coffee store in the early 1980s and has served as its CEO several times. Most recently, Schultz returned to the role of CEO as an outspoken critic of the union and has tried to blunt its progress after winning the right to represent workers at 300 of the corporation's 9,300 corporate-owned stores. Now, last month, an administrative judge in New York ruled that Starbucks had violated federal laws dozens of times with, quote, egregious and widespread misconduct the National Labor Relations Board has received more than 500 unfair labor practice charges against the corporation, and so far, 81 complaints have been lodged by the board's general counsel against the company. As we have discussed many times here at TLN, oftentimes it is much easier to vote a union onto the property than it is to actually negotiate that first contract. And in fact, Senator Sanders made a point that Starbucks seems to be doing just that by not bargaining with the union in good faith. Schultz shot back that the corporation had, in fact, met with the union 85 times. And the union, however, is quick to point out that in most of those cases, the meetings only lasted about 15 minutes. Of note is the fact that Starbucks has recently introduced additional job enhancements, such as faster accrual of sick time and the option of credit card tipping for customers to the exclusion of the stores who have voted in favor of union representation. Starbucks claims that the company cannot offer those benefits to the stores that have voted in favor of unionization because it would violate the law, because they would have to bargain for benefits first. That's a notion that legal experts have disagreed with. And as if all of that were not enough drama, for one week, as we were preparing to come on the air, news that Alexis Rizzo, the Starbucks employee responsible for sparking the Starbucks Workers United Union campaign was fired from her job as a shift supervisor at the Genesee Street store in Buffalo, New York. Rizzo had worked at the store for seven years. Starbucks says she was let go at the end of her shift because she had been late to work on four occasions. Two of those were instances of being one minute late. Both Rizzo and the union are saying the firing came as a form of retaliation for the hearings in Washington last week. We'll be right back with a new direction for the United Auto Workers. In the 1960s and 70s, the United Auto Workers were one of the most powerful labor unions in America. Then UAW President Walter Ruther had a direct line to President Lyndon Johnson and was one of his most trusted advisors. To say a lot has changed would be an understatement. In 1979, the union had 1.5 million members. Today, they have 375,000. The union has suffered from the same plight as all unions in America, the offshoring of jobs, plant closings, and the like. But the union has also been the victim of its own leadership on far too many occasions and has found itself in the sights of corruption scandal after corruption scandal in recent years along with allegations of leadership being too cozy with management. Well, if Sean Fain, the newly minted president of the UAW, has anything to say about it, that is all about to change. Fain, who has been a member of the union for more than 20 years and has served as an officer at the union local in Indiana, representing workers at the Stellantis casting plant, won a narrow victory last week. In speaking after the election, Fain said the race was not just a race about two candidates, it was a referendum on the direction of the UAW, saying for far too long, the UAW has been controlled by leadership with a top-down company union philosophy who have been unwilling to confront management. And as a result, we've seen nothing but concessions. 
corruption, and plant closures. All of this coming in the nick of time as the union prepares for the upcoming negotiations with Detroit's big three automakers in September of this year. We'll be right back with some headlines. Elsewhere in the news, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit has affirmed the ruling of a lower court that Tesla wrongfully fired a worker involved in union organizing activities, a ruling that will allow the NLRB to reinstate the worker, Richard Ortiz, with back pay. Mr. Ortiz said he was looking forward to returning to work at Tesla and also to finishing the job of forming a union. Separately, the court also ruled that Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla, must delete a Twitter post suggesting that workers could lose stock options if they unionize because the post was considered illegally anti-union. If you find your hotel room is being cleaned less than it used to be or that you can give up your daily cleaning in order to earn points redeemable for one one hundredth of a room rate sometime in the future, you wouldn't be wrong. Many hotel chains, besides getting rid of room service, have begun cutting back on staff who clean rooms. And according to the Union Unite here, the move would eliminate some 40% of housekeeping jobs and cost workers $5 billion a year in lost wages. In In response to pressure from unions, dozens of cities have passed legislation requiring hotels to offer daily housekeeping as the norm. Housekeepers report that waiting to clean room after days-long stays take much longer and actually cause them to get behind, causing back-ins at checkups. Not a great way to begin vacation. And finally, after it was found that children were working in food processing plants in Arkansas rather than taking precautions to keep this from happening on a regular basis, Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders signed legislation that would make it easier for companies to put children to work in that state by eliminating the requirement that children under 16 get a state work permit that would require them to have their age verified by a parent or guardian. Now, this is a growing trend throughout the nation, and TLN is in the process of covering the story more in depth. So stay tuned for that in an upcoming show. In the meantime, I'll be right back with some thoughts on the state of unionization in our country. More than 70% of Americans approve of unions, yet 10% of Americans are actually members of unions. On paper, it's been a great couple of years for unions, and we've seen heroes emerge. Chris Smalls, who organized an Amazon warehouse on Staten Island against all odds after being fired. Alexis Rizzo in Buffalo, planting the seeds of unionization with her fellow baristas. Richard Ortiz, the recently reinstated Tesla worker, who can't wait to get back to union organizing. We talked about some of them earlier in the broadcast, and there are hundreds of thousands and thousands more just like them working across the country. And yet, all three of those properties mentioned, Amazon, Starbucks, Tesla, are boldly fighting the unions. And in fact, the laws have changed so much against unions, it's a wonder we have any at all. As Liz Schuler, the president of the FFL-CIO, put it in a recent Senate hearing, the fines these companies pay are simply the cost of doing business for them. In some cases, the fines for violating fishing laws in many states are actually higher than violating labor laws. And in many cases, the unions themselves have been their own worst enemies. Corruption charges at the UAW, $60,000 spent on cigars. Some national union presidents are driving around in high-end vehicles costing more than $100,000 and making incomes that are more than double that of their average members, living off lavish D.C. expense accounts. Unions are politics, and in politics, perception is everything. And with politics comes a changing America, a changing American landscape, where the blame game often falls in the wrong place because of the likes of cable news and social media sites. And far too often, the unions are the enemy, as one tribe blames another for all of its woes. Unions don't see race or color, creed or gender, and that sometimes makes the union the villain in the minds of some. And maybe, in fact, all that union support that's coming from 70% of Americans comes from many who don't actually see themselves as union members. Folks who say, sure, great idea, but I'm good working here from home for my company or my corporation, and in the end, perhaps the jobs we're talking about 
warehouse workers, baristas, assembly line workers, just sort of get shrugged off by many Americans. Maybe we just don't give that smiling face working a double shift and handing us our morning lattes enough respect. Unions, we have a perception problem. We are old and tired and relics of the past, and it's high time we figure out a way out of the darkness. There are models for unionization around the globe where we could begin to take some cues. Corporate board involvement in Germany. Now, how about white collar unions for all these folks kicking and screaming about having to go back to the office three days a week? What about unions for doctors who face the hell of COVID? The possibilities are endless. All we need now is for the leaders of tomorrow to emerge, to bring their charisma to the fore and change the perception of how unions do business. Chris, Alexis, Richard, is that you? Sean Fain, the new leader of the UAW, is that you? Liz Schuler at the AFL, is that you? Where are our leaders of tomorrow who will effectively be able to guide us through the AI revolution now upon us? We're waiting to give you your voice. I'm Mark Harrison, proud union member for 35 years, and I'll see you next week on Labor This Week.